Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers schools of thought in archaeology. By the end of this episode, you will be prepared to discuss different schools of thought and evaluate their goals, research questions, and procedures. In this presentation, a school of thought refers to a worldview or paradigm. It involves an ideology about how the world came to exist and why things operate in the ways that they do. Within the field of archaeology, a school of thought must concentrate on describing and explaining the archaeological record of the material remains of past human behaviors. A school of thought should be able to generate its own significant research questions and develop ways to address those questions with convincing data. People all around the world have developed different cultural traditions, as we can see today in the world's diverse material records of artifacts, sites, and landscapes. Those records all have changed through time. These basic facts need to be accommodated in any logically valid framework or school of thought. Archaeologists, sociologists, historians, and other scholars have developed diverse descriptions of how cultural systems operate. Based on those perspectives, further considerations could refer to the interactions of groups, subgroups, or supergroups. Still more considerations could refer to chronological change in cultural groups or systems at their variable scales. In any given perspective, you should be able to identify the general principles or laws about how cultural systems operate and change. Next, you can develop ways of testing those general principles using real data from archaeological sites. In the academic literature, you can find numerous examples of different philosophical positions and frameworks in archaeology. They often have developed as reactions against their perceptions of one another, whether or not those perceptions have been accurate. They have tended to be presented as if they were formalized theories, theoretical approaches, or perspectives. Many cases have been based on fundamentally incompatible concepts of what theory is and what archaeology is. Perhaps they should be regarded as separate fields of study altogether. When evaluating something that presents itself as a theory or school of thought, you can begin with isolating what really is being proposed as the role of theory relative to method and technique. Equally important, you can assess what is being proposed of relevance for studying the archaeological record. Here, I will not advocate for any particular school of thought in archaeology. Instead, I can summarize just briefly about some of the major influences in the published literature, and I encourage to learn more on your own. Behavioral archaeology has undergone several developments, yet it retains its core of studying how cultural behaviors of the past relate with the archaeological objects that we examine today. In this view, artifacts originally had functioned within cultural systems or systemic contexts, and today in archaeological sites we see only the material remnants in archaeological contexts. A large part of this approach in practice involves learning how materials have transformed through time from their systemic context into their archaeological context. The primary goal, however, is to learn about the past cultural behaviors. Evolutionary paradigms consistently have been important in archaeology, yet remarkably divergent interpretations have been proposed. Most scholars can appreciate that biological evolution cannot be applied wholesale into cultural contexts. The mechanisms, operational units, timescales, and outcomes of evolutionary processes are fundamentally different in biology versus culture. 
oddly enough, these points have been portrayed in radically conflicting descriptions of how evolution works and explanations of why it operates in the first place. As a result, archaeologists can disagree strongly about how evolution figures into archaeology at all levels of high, middle, and low orders of theory. In terms of archaeological study, agency refers to the agents of actions that created the archaeological record. In this regard, people of the past, of course, were important agents, whether intentionally or not. Some aspects of agency operated by the behaviors of individuals, while others occurred due to the forces of society at large. The role of the natural environment often is ignored or de-emphasized, although it should be considered in models of agency. Depending on how a philosophy of agency is constructed, it may or may not actually identify the ultimate cause behind the agents, and therefore the foundations of the school of thought can be questioned. Cognitive archaeology has been possible in places where the material archaeological records already have been described in thorough detail, and therefore these records have been suitable for deeper interpretations. The goal in these cases has been to interpret the cognitive functions and contexts of the people who have created the archaeological materials. Toward this goal, cognitive archaeologists have developed frameworks about how the human mind operates, based largely on studies of psychology and symbology, and then these frameworks are applied to interpret archaeological artifacts, sites, and landscapes. Regarding landscapes in archaeology, numerous definitions and nuances have been proposed about the places that people have inhabited. Landscapes could be perceived as both natural and social environments. Their internal components interrelated in complex ways that could be understood in terms of landscape ecology. Additionally, they changed through time compatible with frameworks of landscape evolution. In every school of thought in archaeology, you can find variable interpretations of even the most basic terminology and definitions. These differences become more complicated when they are implicit rather than explicit in the academic literature. You can begin to make sense of these different schools of thought by clarifying how they portray cultural systems that were responsible for creating the archaeological record in the first place. Next, you can identify what general scope questions are being asked, and how they can be addressed through real data from specific archaeological sites. In concluding this episode, now you should be familiar with schools of thought in archaeology you can evaluate how successfully or unsuccessfully they address their goals and objectives. And you can consider how to improve with different approaches and perspectives. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studios.